Good evening. It's a great pleasure to chair this panel in honor of Ethan Katz's new book, The Burdens of Brotherhood, Jews and Muslims from North Africa to France, Harvard, 2015. Those who will wish now or better later to purchase this book, it is available for sale outside, and I'm sure that many of you will do it after hearing about this most remarkable and path-breaking book, which opens really new ways to think about many, many topics. Its topic, the Jewish-Muslim encounters in France rule, I say it in purpose, so you will refute it immediately, Eitan. <laughs> and it's a real, I don't know, because already at the beginning of the book, Ethan tells us about the difficulties and problems in any kind of description of this issue because of it, uh, because of changes, historical changes during the huge period that he deals with in the book, because of the problems of the ca categories themselves. And maybe one can say that beyond history of these encounters, it's also a, a new history, perhaps, of France from a very unique perspective, besides the fact that this combination of Jews and Muslims as makes new perspective for these issues. As usual here, we will start with a short, very short presentation of the book by the author, Ethan Katz, with Associate Professor of History at the University of Cincinnati, and during the current academic year, he has been a visiting professor at the Vidal Sassoon International Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism, one of the sponsor, the sponsor of this evening, a Lady Davis visiting professor at the Hebrew University and a Yad Nadiv fellow at the National Library. Side being the author of this book, which won several prizes including the 2015 National Jewish Book Award for Writing based on archival material and the 2016 J. Russell Major Prize of the American Historical Association for the Best Book in English on French History. He's also the co-editor of Secularism in Question, Jews and Judaism in Modern Times, and most recently, Colonialism and the Jews and in Indiana it came out in the Indiana University Press. So, but today we are talking about his book. And Eitan, please, we are, you are welcome to present. Good evening. Um, thank you to my friend Nono for those very generous opening words. Thank you in advance to the panelists. Thank you all for coming. I have many more thank yous to do, but I'm going to save those uh, for my response uh, later. For now, I've been asked to offer you a very short overview of the book. So, my research for the burdens of brotherhood began more than a dozen years ago as an attempt to understand France's current Muslim-Jewish crisis. I wondered if Muslims and Jews had long interacted in France primarily as members of opposing ethnic or religious groups or had they rather interacted on multiple levels. Furthermore, I sought to determine what historical forces within or outside of France had most profoundly shaped their relations. I concluded that to answer these questions, we need to begin by thinking ourselves back into a series of moments where relations between Jewish and Muslim individuals and groups were not necessarily conceived either by participants or observers as, quote, Jewish-Muslim interactions. Indeed, one of the central arguments of my book is that what we now call Jewish-Muslim relations in France were not inevitably understood as relations primarily between Jews and Muslims. That is, they were not necessarily based on religion or ethnicity, nor, for that matter, were they necessarily hostile. Rather, Jews and Muslims in France have interacted on myriad terms. They have inhabited common locales, enjoyed common culinary and musical traditions, faced similar or divergent paths to integration as new arrivals in France, participated as allies or opponents in political conflicts, and interacted more intimately as neighbors, friends, and even lovers. 
To assess these wide-ranging interactions, we need to follow the distinctive rhythms of locales. Thus, the book compares relations in three distinctive cities, Paris, Marseille, and Strasbourg. In the book, I examine numerous cases that illustrate how fungible Jewish and Muslim categories and identifications could be. My first chapter focuses on World War I, the foundational moment of Jewish-Muslim relations in France. I begin with a story about how in the spring of 1917, in the trenches of the war, a Jew named Habib and his Muslim comrade Rahmoun debated theological and scriptural differences and similarities between Judaism and Islam. That is, they interacted not merely as adherents of two different faith traditions, but as fellow soldiers. Chapter two focuses on the 1930s, when growing interactions between Jews and Muslims were part of a burgeoning French Mediterranean that was reshaping mainland France in numerous ways. Here, those like the famous Algerian Muslim playwright and musician Mahyadin Bashatarzi and Jewish stars of his acting and musical troupe like Salim Halali, they were fellow performers of Arabic song and Algerian theater in both Algeria and mainland France. The book's third chapter on World War II and the Holocaust begins with the curious case of Sebastian Hasid, an Iranian Muslim. After France fell to the Germans in 1940, Hasid was forced to try to cover for his wife Ilonka, born a Jew in Hungary, converted to Islam, and now hunted by the Nazis and the anti-Semitic Vichy regime. Sebastian and Ilonka were then husband and wife, fellow Muslim worshipers, and business partners running a cafe called, of all things, Little Hungary. The new dynamics in their relationship begin to illustrate how the anti-Semitic persecution of the war years elevated Muslims above Jews and drastically altered the terms on which the two groups interacted. These few examples I've just mentioned point toward the book's second key argument. Jews and Muslims' multiplicity of ways of interacting means that in Jewish-Muslim relations, both the importance and the meaning of Jewish and Muslim identities are best understood as highly situational or contingent that is dependent upon circumstances and variable among individuals and subgroups and across space and time. Only at specific historical moments, particularly in the period following the end of France's colonial empire in the 1960s, did ethnicity and religion become perceived as definitional or overriding and singular in Jewish-Muslim relations. Now, why was decolonization, the end of the French empire, so important? People frequently ask me if events in this place where we stand today, Israel-Palestine, if they have fundamentally shaped Jewish-Muslim interactions in France. And while the Middle East conflict has surely had a growing impact on relations, particularly since 1967, I respond to this question by explaining that there's another place across the Mediterranean, less well-known, whose role has in some ways been more fundamental, and that is Algeria. From shortly after France conquered Algeria in 1830, Algeria wasn't simply a colony. It was actually annexed in large part to France, and so it was as French as Marseille or Lyon. But what is fundamentally important for us is that its inhabitants were not all equally French. Uh, in particular, uh, Jews became full French citizens in Algeria in 1870, and Muslims did not. They did not gain fully equal French citizenship in Algeria until 1958, so only four years before Algerian independence. And so this leads me into the third key argument of my book, which is that these relations have always been what I describe as triangular. So you have a triangle, if you will, with Jews in one corner, Muslims in another corner, and France, the French state, what it means to be French, always the way in which Jews and Muslims are regarding each other and interacting with each other, the third corner of that triangle. As I trace in chapter four of my book, from 1954 to 1961, the French-Algerian War produced a new French Mediterranean, ripe for both increased coexistence and explosive conflict. Algerian Muslims gained semi-legal equal rights, and unprecedented numbers of Jews and Muslims arrived in France from North Africa, and they began to share more and more sociocultural spaces like neighborhoods and cafes. During the war's first several years, Jews and Muslims tested as never before the possibilities for interweaving Jewish or Muslim ethnicity with French citizenship. But by the war's end in 1962, they had to choose between France and the newly independent Algeria. As Jews and Muslims arrived on French shores from North Africa, their identities were being reshaped by the war's outcome that severed Algeria from France and by new French citizenship laws that included Algeria's Jews but excluded its Muslims. And the legal distinctions would have dramatic consequences in terms of neighborhood and education and employment uh, for decades, really, uh, with legacies that persist into the present. Uh, 
But nevertheless, in Paris, Marseille, and Strasbourg, during the same time, many recently landed Jews and Muslims settled in the same streets, where neighborhoods, restaurants, cafes, corner stores, even athletic associations became sites for the forging of sociocultural relations. This delicate coexistence was challenged anew in the years following the June 1967 war in the Middle East and the social uprising known as May 68. I trace this set of developments in the book's sixth chapter. During this period, both Zionism and pro-Palestinian activism made considerable inroads among Jewish and Muslim populations in France. New forms of Jewish and Muslim identity politics entered the public sphere and even affected neighborhoods where Jewish and Muslim coexistence had been quite smooth and amiable for years. As I discuss in chapter seven, the final decades of the 20th century saw Jews and Muslims negotiate between ongoing polarization over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and possibilities for cooperation around other issues. In the book's conclusion, I turned to the matter with which I began, the contemporary Jewish-Muslim crisis in France, tracing the long and short-term trends that helped to account for the events of the early 21st century up to and including the violent anti-Semitic attacks by Muslims in recent years. So I'm gonna stop there. Now I enter the lion's den, or I mean we move to the next phase where we hear critical responses from the panelists to which I very much look forward. Thank you.